So, the mass-luminosity relationship. We just got done talking about how as a main sequence star gets brighter, it gets bigger. Well, actually, the reverse is the reality here. As a star gets more massive, it becomes brighter. This is the mass-luminosity relationship. But let's rewind a minute. How do we measure the actual mass of a star? So far, we've been able to determine the star's color from its black body curve, its temperature from Wien's law, and its spectral class from its temperature. But there are two things we have yet to do. First, understand the basis of the Yerkes classification system, and second, figure out a way to determine the star's mass. Then we can come back to the mass-luminosity relationship and take a look at it. We briefly mentioned the Yerkes spectral classification in the previous video when we began labeling the different parts of the HR diagram and their luminosity classes. Let's briefly review that. The brightest luminosity class is 0, or 1a+, and this applies to the hypergiants or the extremely luminous supergiants. Below that we have 1a and 1b for the luminous and less luminous supergiants, meaning that any star labeled as luminosity class 1ab is somewhere in the middle as an intermediate size luminous supergiant. Then we have class 2 bright giants, class 3 normal giants, class 4 subgiants, and class 5, the main sequence stars, some of which could also be referred to as dwarf stars, particularly those on the right half of the main sequence. The next luminosity class 6 refers to the subdwarfs, which are stars that are slightly smaller than the main sequence stars, but not as small as the white dwarfs, which have a luminosity class of 7. Some examples of each of these types of stars can be seen here, and you can look into them if you're interested. The Yerkes spectral classification scheme, also called the MKK or MK classification after its developers, categorizes stars based on the relationship between the spectral lines and not only the temperature, but the surface gravity of the star as well. Now, how does this happen? Denser stars have a higher surface gravity, resulting in greater pressure broadening of spectral lines. So the spectral lines that you would normally see from various elements appear wider now coming from these stars. Here's why. Let's say we have a blue supergiant star. If these arbitrary turquoise dots represented the individual atoms of mass in this supergiant, we can say that the supergiant is not a very dense object. It has a limited amount of mass over a large volume. Its thin atmosphere means that there are less atoms for the photons to interact with, the photons leaving the core of that star. So we see thinner spectral lines from this star. If we shrink this supergiant and turn it into a star that's only a fraction of its original radius, but keep the amount of atoms the same, we'll have increased the density. Now, if photons try to leave this small, dense star, they'll interact with many atoms on the way out from the core, resulting in larger gaps in their absorption spectra. The width of these absorption lines in a star's spectrum can tell you exactly what type of a star it is. Main sequence stars have a high density, high pressure atmosphere, which creates wide or huge absorption lines. In supergiants, the low density, low pressure atmospheres create narrow or little absorption lines. In some cases, the spectral lines in the spectra of supergiants are so faint that they're barely noticeable. Just like the spectra of Vega and Deneb from before, we can also see here that the spectral lines of Sirius, a main sequence star, are wider than those of Antares, a red supergiant. You can pause the video here to take a closer look at the spectrum of each star and see how it correlates to the type of star associated with it. Now that we've covered the basis of the Yerkes luminosity classification, let's move on to the next thing, determining stellar mass. Now, how do we know exactly how much mass each star actually has? Well, it's impossible to determine the mass for just a singular isolated star. You need stars that are parts of stellar systems. Luckily, most stars don't come individually. Well, the sun does, but other stars? They can come in pairs, in triple systems like Alpha Centauri A, Alpha Centauri B, and Proxima Centauri or systems containing more than three stars, way more than three stars. 
So how do we actually determine the mass of a star? We have to observe it as it orbits its companion. In a binary star system, the two stars will orbit their common center of mass. This center of mass is always going to be located closer to the more massive object. So when two stars orbit each other, we can determine their masses by observing the location of the center of mass of the system. In the case of two uneven masses, we can see that the center of mass is actually closer to the larger star. With some information about the orbits of these two stars and the total mass of the system, physicists and astronomers can actually calculate the mass of each individual star. But this, again, is only possible for systems or groups of stars. As astronomers began determining the masses of more and more stars, they started to notice a relationship between the luminosities of these stars and their masses. This work led to the development of the mass-luminosity relationship. As the stars got more massive, they became more luminous. But the mass-luminosity relationship, at least the one we're about to explore, applies to main-sequence stars only. There are variations of this law that work for the other groupings of stars, but in this class, we'll only focus on the one applicable to the main sequence. When you plot the mass and luminosity of a whole handful of stars, you start to see a trend like this. Notice the scales of each axis increase rapidly, meaning that while this graph looks linear, it's actually not. For a main sequence star, high mass means high luminosity and low mass means low luminosity. The relationship between these parameters follows a cubic rule. For every increment of mass increase, the luminosity increases by a cube of that number. If that doesn't make sense right away, don't worry, we'll break it down in an example soon. Now, in reality, this relationship is written more like this, as a ratio of the luminosities and masses of the sun and the particular star in question. In the denominator of the fraction on the left, we have the luminosity of the sun, which is useful to include since the luminosity of the star in question, or the stellar luminosity, is always given in units of solar luminosities to get a sense of how luminous it is compared to the sun. We can say the same about the mass ratio on the right. The numerator is the mass of the star, and the denominator is the mass of the sun. And this fraction is cubed. Now for that example. You can see it in the next video.